Hi, welcome. This is Right Start Math, Why It Works. My name is Teresa Fulton, and all of this information is based on the work of Dr. Joan Cotter. So Right Start Math is a hands-on, um, manipulative, and card game-based program. We also use a linear fraction chart, which we'll talk about later. The question you always want to ask yourself when you're choosing a curriculum is who is the author? What gives her the right to tell me how to teach this particular subject? So let's take a look at Dr. Cotter and what her background is. She is an engineer from the University of Wisconsin, so she knows how math works in the real world. She's also a Montessori educator. So she, she is very familiar with um, children and how their brains work. Putting the two together is a fabulous combination. She's also the math card games author. And this came about um, because of a personal issue that she had with her family. Her son, Andy, was um, struggling in school. He was in third grade and he was really having trouble with math. He had a lot of math anxiety. She pulled him from that school and put him into what would now be called a charter school. And she had to put in volunteer hours. So her volunteer hours consisted of playing card games with the kids to help them with their math facts. This worked so well, not only for Andy, but also for all of the kids in the school, that the teachers and the parents really encouraged her to publish these math card games. And so that was how the math card games came about. She also became a special needs teacher. And from that developed the activities for learning abacus. Then she became a middle school teacher. I believe it was in an inner city school. She was dealing with seventh graders and she discovered that she needed to teach, take them back to first grade math in order to fill in all the gaps that they had acquired over those seven years. This convinced her that our math education in the US is just a disaster. And so in order to do something about that, she went back and got her PhD in math education from the University of Minnesota with an emphasis in brain research. All right, let's look at the abacus. This is um, specially designed by Dr. Cotter. It's called the Activities for Learning Abacus. We have 10 rows of beads, 10 beads each. So we have 100 total. They're divided in color after five and after 50. And we'll take a look at why that's important later. Ginsburg and other researchers have said that the role of a physical manipulative is to help the child form visual images and thus eliminate the need for the physical manipulatives. The abacus really stands out as a supreme manipulative given that definition. It is visual and tactile. It develops mental images of quantities, strategies, and mathematical operations. Now this is an interesting quote. Ben Pridmore was the world memory champion of 2009. And he said, think in pictures because the brain remembers images better than it does anything else. And we all know that to be true. Otherwise the advertising industry would not work as well as it does. So how can we help kids think in pictures about math? Let's look at subitizing. Subitizing is the quick recognition of a quantity without counting. So tell me how many fingers you see here. It's three, right? Did you have to count it? No, not at all. You saw right away. That is subitizing. That's the quick recognition of a quantity without counting. How about this time? Do you see seven? Did you have to count them? No. All right, so here's a little test for you. Try to visualize eight apples in a row lined up on your counter. No grouping. Can you picture those eight apples? It's pretty difficult to do. This is what it would look like if you could do it. Now try to visualize five as red and three as green. Is that a little bit easier? It should be. That's what that would look like. So grouping by fives is really helpful. And we do it everywhere. When we're telling time, counting money, 
and even the early Romans grouped by fives. So this has been around for a long time. We need grouping in order to visualize quantities. Take a look at this rod. Can you tell how many divisions there are there without counting? It's not grouped by fives, so it's really hard to see the quantity. Lucky for us, our hands are already grouped by fives, so that's a nice little tool. And because of that, the abacus is also grouped in fives. Now let's say I'm just starting off with a youngster. It doesn't really matter how old the child is. We want to make sure that they can subitize. So I will ask, can you show me three? And they'll hold up three fingers. And then I'll say, great, can you enter three? Now I want them to enter those three beads all at once in one um, complete movement, not counting individual beads, one, two, three. If they do count, then I would just go to the next line and give the three a nudge and say, can you enter the three beads now? And then the next line, the third line, say, okay, can you do it without me touching? And they should be able to do that for sure. So once they get the idea that they should not count the beads, then it'll be very easy for them to subitize and move those beads all at once. Once they've done that, you can show them the numeral three. Let's try it again. Show me five, enter five, here's the numeral five. Show me seven, enter seven, here's the numeral seven. Show me 10, all 10 fingers, all 10 beads. Here is the numeral 10. Now, you've noticed we haven't been counting those beads. We've just been subitizing them and entering them as a group. The next activity you could do is to have the kids build the stairs. Now, this is counting because I would have them say, once they've built the stairs, I'd have them read out the number. One, two, three, four, five, and so on. So that is counting, but it's counting with meaning because they're looking at the quantity while they're saying the name of the number. It's not just a, a sequence of words thrown together. Okay, let's look at using the abacus for adding. Here we have four plus three, that's our equation. So I'm going to enter four on the abacus and partially enter three. And I'll say four plus three equals, and I push them together. The quantity can be seen immediately. You've already seen this, this amount represented while we were talking about subitizing. That is seven. We don't have to count it. Now compare that to a typical work, worksheet. Are you able to subitize that? The quit, quantity is not quickly recognizable. All right, another thing that we can do, a very important thing to do, is to teach the kids what makes 10. So we can use the abacus for this. Enter one, see what's left over on that top line. It's nine, so one plus nine, two plus eight, three plus seven, four plus six, and so on, until you get all the way back to nine plus one. Once you've introduced what makes 10, you're gonna to wanna to reinforce those concepts with games for practice. One real simple game and a very fun one that the kids love to play is called Go to the Dump. It's a go fish type of game where the pairs are one and nine, two and eight, whatever makes 10, three and seven, so forth. You just need the basic number cards, one through nine, and an abacus. In the beginning, they're going to be checking to make sure that they're asking for the right amount and that's good. Eventually they won't need the abacus to play the game. There's also an app for your devices, phones or iPads. Um, it's called Go to 10. And you may be wondering, okay, other than it being fun, why is it that we're encouraging you to play math card games? And the reason for that is that games are to math as books are to reading. Just like you wouldn't use worksheets to teach your child how to read, you'd give them interesting books, right? The same thing applies for math. Let's give them interesting games to apply that math. 
Games provide the interesting repetition needed for automatic responses, and the plus is it's in a social setting. More importantly, games provide an application for the new information. The kids want to know what they're learning because they want to win. All right. Place value is an interesting um, problem for many students, and unfortunately, it doesn't seem to be readily solved in the general population. And we'll talk about why that is in a minute. The author of Trevisio Arithmetic of 1478, that was written over 500 years ago, considered place value so important that it was listed first among the five operations of arithmetic. I always thought there was only four, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. But this author says, nope, place value is even more important because without it, you can't do the other operations. Place value organizes numbers into neat little packets. And without it, computational algorithms make little sense. Let's take a look at what that looks like. So children often think of 14 as 14 ones and not a 10 and four ones. The pattern that's needed to make sense of those tens and ones is hidden in the English language. All right, how do we solve that problem? If they can't make sense of the tens and ones, let's use the abacus. Here I'll enter 10 on the first line and 10 on the second line. Can you tell me how many beads I've entered? Now, you may have said 20, and of course you're correct, but bear with me, for a little while, we're gonna be calling that 210. This would be, what do you think? Yes, 2104, good, okay. So 2104, now we have 2108, good. And of course, this is 310. I'm gonna tell you a little bit of a story about this. My son was six years old when I first started teaching him um, as a homeschooler. And I asked him to write the number 13 and he wrote 31. Well, obviously he didn't have a clue what the difference was between 13 and 31. And the reason why he wrote 31 is because he heard the three first. So he thought he should write that number first. Um, once I introduced him to Write Start, I showed him on the abacus one time, just one time, the difference between 10-3 and 3-10-1, and he got it. He never made that mistake again. And that was really valuable for him. He's dyslexic, and so it was very natural for him to confuse the numbers and flip them around. But the transparent place value, the transparent way of naming numbers, really helped him understand the quantity. Okay, so there we had 310. This is 3106. And how does this work? All right, 10 is obviously 10. 11 is 10, 1. 12 is 10, 2. 20 is 210. 21 is 210, 1. 210, 2. 210, 3. All the way to 910, 9. Now, you might be wondering, why are we teaching the kids to name their numbers this way? How is this helpful? Well, we use it for two reasons. One, patterning. We say 3 million, we say 3,000, we say 300. Why don't we say 310? Remember, math is all about patterns. So let's stick with the pattern to make life easier for everybody, right? The other reason is place value. All right. So here I will tell the student to enter 310. They enter 310 and I bring out a place value card. I'm gonna to point to the three and say three and to the zero and say 10. So I've just identified the written numerals, the three and the zero as 310. Now we're gonna do 3107. Slide the seven on top of the zero. We have 3107. Enter 610. Here's the 610 place value card. Now enter 610 two, slide the two over on top of the zero, and we have 610 two. If you enter all the beads, we have 1010, 1010, or we also call it 100. 
Now you can use the syllables in the words to help the kids identify what it is. So I would point to the three in the 30 and say 310, then 300, 3000. That's a bit of a stretch, but you don't have to do it for very long. Now, when you and I were taught place value, we learned to build from right to left, ones, tens, hundreds, thousands. And then we had to reverse it and read it from left to right. Now, that can cause a lot of issues for kids, especially if they have a bit of dyslexia. So, with the transparent number naming, we're going to build these numbers with place value cards from left to right, exactly the way we read it. So, here we have 3,600. 5, 10, 8. Now, if I get all the way to the right side here and my student can't remember what the 6 is, they can just peel off the cards and say, oh, yeah, that's right, it's 600. Okay. So, just like reciting the alphabet doesn't teach reading, you know, if your child can sing the alphabet song, that doesn't mean that he or she knows how to read, right? Well, being able to count to 100 doesn't mean that they understand arithmetic. And just as we first teach the sound of letters, we must first teach the name of the quantity. This is the math way of naming numbers or the transparent number naming system. Interestingly, children in Asia learn mathematics using the math way of number naming. And they understand place value in first grade. Only half of US children understand place value at the end of fourth grade. So why is that? Well, remember, mathematics is the science of patterns, and the patterned math way of number naming greatly helps children learn number sense. So let's take a look at a little bit of research that was done. There were two groups of kids divided. One group had been taught the math way of naming numbers, and the other group had been taught just the traditional way of naming numbers. They were asked to use 10 rods and individual one pieces. They were like the, um, you know, the blocks that just stick together. They uh, were told to build 48. And they did so. Both groups did fine. No problem. However, they were asked to then subtract 14. So the group that had been taught the traditional way of naming numbers subtracted 14 individual blocks. And those who counted well got the right answer. But not everybody in that group got the right answer because they made mistakes in counting. The second group that had been taught the math way of naming numbers or the transparent number naming system, they removed 110 rod and four individual ones. Every single student in that group got the right answer, including a young boy who had been born prematurely, he had had a lot of learning disabilities and other ish health issues that really hindered his learning, yet he was perfectly capable of doing this problem. So that's just a simple example of how learning the math way of naming numbers helps the kids understand number sense. Now you may be wondering, okay, how long are they going to walk around talking like this because it's a little embarrassing when grandma's looking at me going, hmm, they don't even know their numbers right. We introduce those traditional names in one easy lesson. So here I'd have the students enter 410. And I'd say, well, how much is this? And they'd say 410. Okay. Did you know that 10 can also be said T? It can. So 410 becomes 40. Very simple. All right. 810 becomes 80. And now let's look at the teens. That will also take one lesson, but we're going to do it separately from the tens that we were already working on. And first, we're going to play a word game with the kids. I'm going to say the name, the word fireplace, and you will say the reverse of that. Place fire. Okay. Newspaper, you would say paper news. Good. Box mail, mailbox. Excellent. All right. Now I'm going to ask the kids to enter 10 4. 
Did you know that another way to say 10 is teen? Teen four becomes 14. That's not hard, is it? All right, let's try another one. Enter 10, eight. Then we have teen eight, 18. All right, now you may be wondering, what do we do about 11 and 12? Have you noticed that 11 and 12 give you absolutely no clue as to how much that quantity is? There's a reason for that. All right, 11, the word 11 came about back in the Middle Ages. The people were looking at this number and said, what are we going to call that? And they said, oh, well, it's a one left over from the 10. So let's call it a one left. That flipped to a left one, and that slurred into the word 11. Now, 12 has a similar background. Back in the Middle Ages, the W was pronounced. So it was two left, and two left became 12. True story. All right. The next thing that we're going to talk about is strategies. So what is a strategy? It's a way to learn a new fact or recall a forgotten one. And a visual representation is a powerful strategy. So let's use our visual representation with the abacus. The first strategy we're going to learn is the complete the 10 strategy. I'll enter nine on the top line and five on the next. And then I'm going to identify the beads that I'm going to trade to complete the 10 on that top row. So when you see that red circle, that's the child's finger touching that bead and this one, and we're going to trade. So I'll say, okay, one, two, three, trade. And they trade and they can see their answer right away. Their answer is 14 or 10, four. Let's try it again. Nine plus seven. Enter nine on the top line, seven on the next. Identify the beads that are going to trade. And we have 16 or 10, 6. Now, the next strategy that we're going to talk about is the two fives strategy. I'll enter eight on the top line and six on the next. Can you see right away that there's two fives? So if I have two fives, I know I have 10. And what's left over is four. So I have 10, 4 or 14. How about seven plus five? Enter seven on the top line, five on the next. Identify the two fives, there's my 10. I have two left over, my answer is 10, two or 12. We can also do this with subtraction. The three strategies we're gonna talk about today are part from 10, all from 10, and going up. All right. Here's our equation, 15 minus nine. I'm going to enter 15, and then I'm gonna subtract, this is the part from 10 strategy, I'm gonna subtract five and then four. And my answer is six. Didn't even have to count it, did ya? All right, let's do that again, enter 15. And now I'm gonna take all from the 10. So I'm gonna subtract nine from the top line, and I'm still left with six. Now this may surprise some of your students, but it's a good kind of surprise. They have just learned that, oh my goodness, we can solve problems in different ways. And that is very helpful, both with math and just in general life problems. There's more than one way to solve a problem. Okay, so the next one, the last strategy for subtraction that I'm gonna talk about is going up. Instead of starting with 15, I'm just gonna start with nine and move up to 15. How many do I have to enter? Six. So all three strategies got me the right answer and that answer in this case is six. Now you may be wondering why in the world do my kids need to learn strategies? Why can't they just memorize their facts? Well, several good reasons for learning strategies, but the one that comes to mind right now is the fact that we, can use these strategies in different circumstances based on those circumstances. So for example, when would you use the going up strategy? Can you guys think of an example? Well, I know one. 
let's say I went to the convenience store and I wanted to buy a pack of gum and it was 89 cents. <clears throat> and I wanted to know how much change I was going to get back. I give the do a dollar to the clerk and I'm not going to sit there and go, okay, a dollar minus 89 cents, borrow, borrow. Oh, what was that? I don't remember. No, I'm going to say 89 cents plus a penny is 90 cents plus a dime is a dollar. So I'm getting back 11 cents change. Very good example of how in that case, I want to use this different kind of strategy. You also may wonder, okay, well, just memorizing the facts. Well, in that case, memorizing the facts wouldn't have helped me, right? Also, what if you forgot your facts? You need a strategy to figure out what the answer really is. So those are two good reasons to use strategies. <clears throat> All right. If we flip the abacus over to the second side, you'll see that there are place values marked there. Cleared is when the beads are down and we have the thousands column. There's two wires to each of these. Thousands, hundreds, tens, and ones. Let's start with this problem. Eight plus six. I'm going to enter eight beads. Notice how I'm keeping the beads even. This will help me know when I've passed 10 and need to trade. So eight, now I'm gonna enter six. And before I get it all the way entered, I'm going to stop and check and make sure. Do I have six? Yes, I do. Okay, go ahead and enter it all the way. And do I need to trade? Yes, I do, because I have more than 10 in that one column. So I'm going to trade 10 ones. I'll trade 10 ones for one 10. And my answer is 14. Now I didn't have to trade in order to get that answer. I could see it right away. So I'll back up here a sec. I could see that my answer was 14 even before trading, but we know we have to carry that one. So we're gonna trade those 10 ones and enter 110. So we have 1104. Now you may wonder how do I know to remove how do I know when I've removed 10 beads without counting? Well, if you notice there's four blue beads that are being removed, I want to mirror that on the top that I'm leaving behind four yellow beads because I'm taking four blue beads. And then without counting, I know assuredly that I am removing 10. I am pushing 10 down and replacing that with 110. All right. This can be expanded to four digit addition, for example. Here we'll enter 3,000, 600, 510, 8. Now I'm going to start at the right and I'm going to enter eight ones. And I can see right away I need to trade. So remember, I'll leave behind six yellow beads. I'll remove the 10 ones and I'll trade it for 110. Check and make sure that I did it right. Yep, I did. I'm gonna trade. And now I'm gonna write down the answer. I have six beads in the ones. And because I traded, I will carry one because we added one to the tens column. Now we'll add three beads to the tens column. See how many we have there? There's just one missing from the 10, so we know it's nine. I didn't have to do any trading. Now I'm gonna add seven to the hundreds column. I do need to trade, subtract the 10. So trade 10 hundreds for 1,000. I write down my answer, I have three hundreds and I traded, so I'm gonna carry the one. Now I add 2,000, and my answer is 6,396. So this is a really good um, way of showing the kids why they need to carry that one. I know when I was in school, I was in second grade, I carried the one because Mrs. Earn asked me to carry the one. She told me that I needed to carry the one. I didn't carry the one because I understood that it was a group of, one, of 10 ones moving over to the tens column. And I think many people have had that experience. So most children who learn to add on the AL Abacus 
transition to paper and pencil algorithm without further instruction. So they already know what they're doing, why they need to carry the one, and, um, and they can move on. They don't have to be using their abacus, you know, when they walk off to college. It is just used as a tool to get them the information that they need, and then they on their own will give up using it. So you don't ever have to worry about taking it away. All right, let's move on to multiplication. <clears throat> Here we have um, six entered twice, right? So I'm gonna say that's called six taken two times or six times two. This is six taken three times, six taken four times. So what is the answer for six taken four times or six times four? Well, here we can use the two five strategy. We have 10, 20, and what's left over? Four. So we have 24 or two ten four. Here we have five times seven. Once again, two five strategy, we've got 10, 20, 30, five. Or once the kids have gotten to this point, they have been using the abacus for so long that they know that that blue quadrant up there is 25. So they can just start with 25 and add 10 to it. The answer is still 35. How about seven times seven? Here we have 25, another 10 is 35, another 10 is 45, plus four is 49. All right, let's try nine times three. So we could do the complete the 10 strategy. We could use that. We're gonna trade the beads until we've got them all moved over. There we go. Our answer is two, 10, seven. But another strategy is we could look at the whole picture and say, how much is 10 times three? And then subtract three. So 10 times three is 30 minus three is 27. How about nine times seven? Okay, nine times seven, let's say 10 times seven is 70, minus seven is 63. Now don't forget, Right Start Math uses these tools like the abacus and the fraction chart, which I'll show you in a little bit, to teach the concepts. And then we reinforce those concepts with the card games. We do have worksheets, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, and those are mainly a check for understanding. By the time they get to their worksheets, unless it's an activity, um, they are just proving to you that they can get it on a piece of paper, that what they have in their brain can be transmitted to that paper. Okay, so games are really important for practicing their math facts. And they're far more enjoyable than doing page after page of, you know, 50 problems each. And more effective. Okay, so one game for multiplication that's really fun is called Ring Around the Products. So we take the product cards or the multiplication cards, we lay out six of them and surround them with the basic number cards, one through 10. Okay, shuffled up, so it's random. All right. I'll go first and I'll look at the number 54 and I'll say to myself, okay, are there any numbers around the outside of that circle that when multiplied together equal 54? Can you guys see two numbers that when multiplied together equal 54? I do. I see the six and the nine, right? Okay, so I can take those cards. So I take the six, the nine, and the 54. Now I move on to the 12. Are there any numbers when multiplied together in the outer circle that equal 12. Sure enough, two times six. We could have also done three times four, but there wasn't a four available, right? Okay, so I would keep playing these blue cards. Um, once I take the two and the six and the 12, there's not gonna be a six available for the 42. So I normally it would be six times seven, but it's not available. So I just have to skip it. I move on to 50, is there a five times 10? No, there's not. I move on to 15, is there a three times five? Sure enough, I could take that. But once I take that three, I can't take the nine, so there's no three, 
three times three left, right? Okay, so then my turn would be over and the next person gets to go. We'd fill in those multiplication cards, we would fill in the basic number cards, and the next person's turn continues through all six of those blue cards, blue numbered cards. All right, well, aside from multiplication facts and um, just getting kids to recognize quantities, fractions come up often as a big stumbling point for children. Now, Right Start Math uses a linear model chart. Um, this model is much more effective than the pie charts because you can make comparisons very easily. So we really encourage you to use the linear chart. And you can start with kids as young as kindergarten teaching them about fractions so that by the time they're using it a lot in math, it's not um, scary anymore. They've, they're familiar with fractions. They're comfortable with them. So one easy way to introduce fractions is to start off like this. How many fourths are in a whole? If you don't know, you count them. Oh, there's four fourths in a whole. How many fifths are in a whole? Once again, you just count them. Five fifths. How many eighths are in a whole? Eight eighths. All right. Once we know that, once we know what makes one, we can move on. Which is more? Third, three fourths or four fifths? Well, let's just check. Here's three fourths, and here is four fifths. The comparison is very easy to see. Four fifths is a little bit more. How about seven eighths? or eight ninths. Ooh, eight ninths slides by just by a hair, but it is more. All right, once we can make those comparisons, let's move on to this. What is half of half? Now remember, you will have a whole fraction chart that's complete, and you'll have another one that's broken up into puzzle pieces. So these pieces are movable. So when you see me highlight something on here, you could actually be physically moving that piece to make comparisons. So what is half of a half? Well, here's the half. And when it's divided in half, the answer is one fourth. What is one third of one half? Once again, you can slide that half piece down see where it's divided up into three and you see that it's one sixth that is multiplying fractions and you didn't even have to talk about it you didn't even have to say it was multiplying fractions the kids are already multiplying fractions and it was really easy nobody cried all right um this mathematics educator from england cockcroft said that the now well-established fact that those who are mathematically effective in daily life seldom make use in their heads of the standard written methods which are taught in the classroom. Well, that begs the question, why are we teaching those methods if they're not used by mathematically effective people, right? Why would we do that? Instead, shouldn't we be teaching the children to think like my math minded people already think that is much more effective now you probably had experiences whether you were considered yourself a math minded person or not when you were in school did you have the experience where you maybe weren't math minded and so you followed the rules you did exactly what the teacher did you could add in a line carry the one add the tens whatnot and the math minded people have figured out a, an easier strategy on their own, right? Or you were the math-minded person and wondering what is taking everybody so long? It's because those people who were taking longer were following these ineffective standard written methods. They weren't taught the quicker methods, the, the methods that are more effective for mental math. So really to do our students a favor we need to be teaching them to think like math-minded people. All right, so how does Right Start Math work? We use the abacus to develop visualization, which you already saw is really important. It makes mental math so much faster. 
we teach topics in different ways with different approaches so that the kids can see how math is applied in real life. Fractions are presented in a linear format because comparisons are much easier on a frac linear fraction chart than in a pie chart. Games are the practice and review, so much more enjoyable than doing a lot of worksheets and far more effective. 15, 10 to 15 minutes of a game is equal to a worksheet. They're far more likely to play more games than to ask for more worksheets as well. And we use over 20 different well thought out manipulatives. These are not gimmicky manipulatives. They're not just go to your junk drawer and, and pick something. They're really well thought out manipulatives that can be used in multiple ways. So you'll have manipulatives and they will be very useful and you'll see that. And the books are arranged in levels rather than grades. This is to help those kids who maybe they have to start a couple of years back you know, maybe you have a fifth grader who needs to go to third grade math to actually fill in those holes. They're not going to have to stare at the big old three on the front of the cover. It'll have a letter on it instead, which will mean nothing. So that's really helpful for those kids who have to um, go back a few grades. Okay, how are the lessons set up? Every lesson is set up pretty much the same way. You always have your objectives and your materials. I really didn't ever do any prep using this program. I just would make sure that I gathered my materials. Now some people feel more comfortable reading the lesson the night before and I'd say that's the maximum that you have to do. The activities for teaching are on the left hand side of each page and those are very easy to follow. You just read them and you ask the, the student, your child, the questions. Um, and lucky for you, they have the answers in the book. So you didn't have to have your cup of coffee or maybe it didn't kick in yet. Okay, the other side of the page, the right-hand side, is an explanation. These are notes for you as the teacher. So maybe it will say, now's a good time to introduce such and such. Or it might say, don't tell them the algorithm, let them figure it out. Because you know when that light bulb goes off in your head, you never forget what you learned. But somebody could tell you time and time again an algorithm or some other fact and you keep forgetting it. So we really want the kids to discover how math works. But these are just little notes for you. Sometimes there aren't any and sometimes there are. All right. This program is an award-winning program. We have received awards from various organizations. Um, there's the Parents Seal of Approval, the Old Schoolhouse Excellence in Education, and the Learning Success Institute, which specializes in programs for children with learning issues. We're very happy to announce that we have won the Practical Homeschooling Award first place since 2014, and even the most recent in 2019. So Richard Skemp, a mathematics educator, says that math needs to be taught so that 95% is understood and only 5% memorized. What does he mean by that? Well, what he means is 5% memorized, they're talking about definitions, like what's a quadrilateral, what is a polygon, those kinds of things. The rest of it really does need to be understood. And that's our goal at Right Start, is that students come through our program and really understand how math works. Dr. Cotter says, our goal as teachers of mathematics is to help our children transform, expand, and refine these beginning ideas into deeper mathematical thinking. So she doesn't want you to be satisfied with just knowing the basics, but to actually be able to go beyond and to explore how math is surrounding us, right? Math is involved in more occupations than, than pretty much anything else. So it's very important that our students, in order to succeed, have a good understanding of math. So if you'd like to contact us, you could do so through our website, email, or phone. We always have people available to answer your questions, and these are people who are using the program and who really understand how it works. So I'd like to thank you for joining me for Right Start Math, Why It Works, and I hope that you have a great day. Thanks so much.